I'm Aisha Pittman, Senior Director of Payment and Quality Policy at Premier. Today's program is designed to provide you with information regarding the proposed changes to the Medicare Shared Savings Program. Thank you for joining us. We are recording today's call. You'll be able to watch the recording by visiting the newsroom section of premierinc.com later this week. We will also notify you via email once the recording is available for viewing. We've set aside an hour for today's event and we'll be taking your questions at the end of the program. You can submit a question at any time by using the question and answer space on the left hand side of your screen. Uh, so let me introduce you to my co-presenter for today, Seth Edwards, who is a principal with, in population health with Premier. Um, we're also joined by Karen Borman from Health Policy Alternatives. So today we have quite a packed agenda. We'll just be going over all of the aspects of the rule. Um, this first call is you know, to provide a high-level overview we may be having additional webinars uh, in the future to dive into specifics since there is quite a lot within this rule. So just to remind you, this rule was released last week on August 9th. It's set to be published uh, in the Federal Register on Friday. Um, as a summary, it eliminates tracks one and two, although you can continue an existing agreement, and then establishes a new basic and enhanced track. The enhanced track is essentially track three. There's some expansion of the existing waivers. Um, there is now choice in beneficiary assignment methodology and a new beneficiary incentive program that was mandated by the, bu the Budget Act of 2018. Uh, just a reminder, and there's actually an error on here. This is the um, uh, shared savings proposed rule. Um, comments are due October 16th, 2018. Uh, these are instructions for how to submit comments. We will be working with all of our membership to um, uh, weigh in on this role and develop comments, and we expect to have a webinar um, in the next month to six weeks walking through Premier's comments on the role. So diving in, um, we first wanted to start with giving you an overview of these new basic and enhanced tracks. These next two slides are essentially summary slides that uh, you could, you know, keep on hand to just keep it straight of, of what's included in each of the tracks. So the basic track is essentially a glide path that has five levels within it. The first level is, um, is named A and B, and these are the no downside risk uh, side, is more comparable to the prior track uh, one. But the major difference is, is that uh, you can only save up, the shared savings rate is 25%. Then the next level, level C, the shared savings rate increases to 30% and it then has um, some downside risk. And that risk is 2% of the ACO participant revenue, but capped at 1% of the historical benchmark. Then level D is a 40% shared savings rate with uh, potential losses up to not 4% of the ACO participant revenue and then capped at 2% of the, uh, or the historical benchmark. And then the last track in the basic is uh, level E where the shared savings rate goes up to 50%. Um, and uh, then the shared losses um, are now set at 8% of the ACO participant revenue and capped at 4% uh, uh, of the historical benchmark. However, for this track, CMS has indicated that they will set the shared losses at whatever the nominal risk threshold standards are under the quality payment program. So 8% revenue or 4% of the benchmark is currently set for performance years uh, 2019 and 2020. However, you may recall in the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule rule, uh, CMS proposed to um, increase that threshold over time. So while nothing has been finalized, whatever track E will align with the requirements under the quality payment program. And then finally, the, the enhanced track is essentially uh, the current MSSP track three. The 
uh, sharing rate is 75% and the losses are one minus the final sharing rate, uh, not to exceed 15% of the updated benchmark. So to provide a few more uh, high level things about the, the basic and enhanced tracks, um, we'll get into details of all of these throughout the presentation. So uh, they are allowing choice of a beneficiary assignment methodology in all of the tracks. Across all of the tracks, you can elect to go to higher risk um, at any point in the um, program. However, once you reach the highest level of risk in track E, you stay there for the uh, remainder of your agreement. Um, as I noted, track the basic track E and the enhanced track do qualify as advanced APMs under the qualified or under the Quality Payment Program, or QPP. Uh, basic tracks A through D do not qualify. Uh, we'll talk about a beneficiary incentive program, which is for um, any of the downside risk tracks. So that's all of the tracks minus basic track level A and B. Um, similarly, for the telehealth waivers, it's available with prospective assignment in any of the tracks that have downside risk as with the SNF three-day uh, three rule waiver. So this is sort of the high-level summary of the, the tracks and the options. We'll now dig into some more of the details. So first, uh, in terms of the agreement pe period, it is longer than previous. The agreement periods are now five years. They are proposed to be five years instead of three years. They are proposing that the model will start on July 1 of 2019. And so with that, the first, if you enter the program on July 1, 2019, then your uh, first agreement would be five years and six months. Uh, again, setting the performance, uh, the, the performance period at each calendar year. So one thing you'll notice with the July 1 start date that there is a six-month performance period. Um, and so what they're proposing to do here is for any ACOs who agreements are expiring at the end of 2018, they are proposing that you can extend your agreement uh, through June 30th of 2019. And so with that, they um, are maintaining the um, prospective and retrospective beneficiary assignment rules and uh, um, but they will be reconciling, and how they will account for this is to reconcile on the entire calendar year and then prorate it for a six month period. They'll do a similar thing for any ACOs that start July 1 of 2019. The, the uh, assignment methodologies will remain the same as they otherwise would, and then the reconciliation would be on a 12 month calendar year and prorate it for six months. So for an ACO that extends through June 30th, 2019 and then enters the program um, for July 1, 2019, you would have two six-month reconciliations, although the reconciliation would essentially be performed on that whole 12-month year. It would just be prorated um, for six months. And then with quality for um, in both scenarios, they would base it on an entire full year of the 2019 reporting period. Um, I will note that CMS considered all some other alternatives, such as delaying the start of the program until January 1, 2020, but they uh, did not want to have such a gap in the program. Um, they also considered including the first six months in the five-year agreement, so that if you started in July 1, you would actually only have four and a half um, uh, months. So there were some alternatives considered there as well. So um, considering the basic a little bit more about the basic risk track. As I um, mentioned, there are five levels, A through E, A and B have no downside risk. And with this, CMS is proposing that you automatically transition to the next level. Um, the exception would be those ACOs that start in July for that short six-month performance year. They would stay in whatever track they enter in for um, one and a half years. And then once, uh, so you automatically uh, advance each year. Once you reach track E, you remain there for the completion of your five-year agreement. 
So say you enter at track D and then you're automatic in year one and you're automatically advanced to track E in year two, you would stay in track E for years two through five. There's also the option to take on higher levels of risk than planned at any at the start of any performance year. So if you're in track B, you would naturally automatically advance to track C, but you could elect to jump to track D. If you do that, you then would still automatically be advanced. So it does not give you two years in track D. What would happen is if you went from B to D, the following year you would still go to E. Uh, you can make this election uh, before the start of the performance period, and they have not set timelines, but have just said that uh, the timing would be similar to the MSSP application. And also note that your historical benchmark would not be rebased, uh, uh, would not be rebased as a result of taking on more risk. So then going into the sharing loss limit determination, as I mentioned earlier, it is a percentage of the ACO participant total Part A or B revenue capped at a, uh, at a percentage of the historical benchmark. So um, the things to emphasize here is that it is the AB revenue de determination is for all providers and suppliers that bill under the 10 of the ACO. Um, it's not just the beneficiaries that are uh, assigned, it's all providers and suppliers. There's no truncation, um, and this revenue determination does not remove other payments such as DISH, uncompensated care, or IME, and that it does include payments adjustments from the other um, quality programs such as the, the hospital value-based purchasing program and um, the merit incentive payment system. Um, they'll also include payments um, under demos, pilots, and time-limited programs to the extent that those payments are identifiable. And so um, what they'll essentially do uh, to determine the benchmark is calculate the revenue, and it's all providers and suppliers under the 10 of the ACO, and then apply the applicable percentage based on which track you are, and then look at the um, percentage of the, the applicable benchmark percentage. And so if the revenue uh, amount at risk is less than the historical benchmark, you would be under a revenue-based benchmark. If the revenue percentage is higher than the historical benchmark, then the, uh, your, your uh, amount at risk would be the historical benchmark. Getting into some other things, as I mentioned, um, there is a choice in the beneficiary assignment methodology, and Seth will go into some details of what those, uh, how those are structured. So you can choose prospective assignment or preliminary prospective assignment with retrospective reconciliation, which I think throughout this presentation for shorthand we just call retrospective. Um, you would, an ACO would automatically maintain uh, whichever uh, beneficiary assignment method they choose um, throughout the duration of the agreement, but you have the option to change your uh, beneficiary assignment method at the beginning of each performance year. And again, they have not set timelines, but it would align with whatever the MSSP application timeline is. Um, this has no impact on the voluntary alignment process that Seth will go into, but um, it will uh, cause an update to uh, your historical benchmark if you change the assignment approach. So now I want to get into um, some of the participation options. Um, most notably in this rule, CMS provides different options based on whether an ACO is deemed high revenue or low revenue. And how they look at this is a high revenue is if your total AB revenue for all participants that are billing under the 10 of the ACO is greater than 25% of the um, A and B expenditures for your assigned beneficiaries. 
Um, and so CMS uh, in the rule uh, discusses that they believe um, any ACOs that include um, institutional providers, so essentially hospitals as participants, would be considered um, high revenue ACOs. Uh, they also, I will note in the rule, uh, spend a lot of time discussing some alternatives for how they would define uh, high revenue versus low revenue. They thought of things such as using physician-led versus hospital-led categories and also considering small versus large ACOs. Essentially, um, what they aim to do with this is they are wanting to reward the smaller physician-led or low revenue ACOs in some way. And so they're seeking comments there around how, what other ways they can encourage them to participate in the program, whether that's through um, a um, higher shared savings rate, a lower MSR. Um, so uh, the other thing to note here is that for, as proposed, the high revenue um, ACOs would be limited to one agreement under the basic track, whereas the low revenue ACOs would uh, have up to two agreements under the uh, basic track. Some other definitions to know uh, for that relate to the participation um, options is they define renewing ACOs, and these are ACOs that have a participation agreement that expired and then they enter into a new agreement or that they terminate their agreement and then enter into a new agreement. So this is essentially anyone participating now or um, with an agreement ending in 2018 or those that are in mid-agreement and want to end their, terminate their current agreement and um, enter through the basic track. They then define re-entering ACOs, and this is um, the same legal entity identified by 10 that might have had a break in agreement. So, for example, if there is an ACO currently um, that expires in 2018, decides not to apply for 2019 or extend, but then uh, applies to re-enter for 2020, um, that would be considered a re-entering ACO. They also uh, define a re-entering ACO as a new legal entity that has not participated, but more than 50% of its participants were included in ACO. Um, and that can be additive across ACOs. It doesn't have to be that they were all included in one ACO uh, previously. And they will um, assess that 50% by looking at the five most recent um, performance periods. They did consider some alternative approaches here by thinking about the percentage of participants that were in the same ACO previously or the percentage of assigned beneficiaries that were um, in a prior ACO and are under would be assigned under a new legal entity as alternatives. Their, um, Purpose here is, uh, as they uh, noted in their press releases, they're uh, trying to avoid gaming the system. Their aim is to, inc uh, to uh, push ACOs along the risk progression, and so they want to avoid having new legal entities come in and start in downside risk if those entities have parti previously participated in the program. Similar aim is, is here with the experienced versus inexperienced, and this is um, experienced versus inexperienced with downside risk. So inexperienced is the legal entity has not participated in any risk-based ACO or less than 40% of the ACO participants were in risk-based ACOs. Experience is if you're over, if the, ent the legal entity was previously in a downside risk ACO, or 40% or more of the participants were in a downside ACO, and it would have a similar five-year look back. And as I mentioned before, this could be additive. So if you know two separate ACOs ended uh, that were in the same region and a new legal entity was formed, um, and one of the prior ACOs was track three, or there were two separate track three ACOs that ended and a new legal entity formed, even though 
they weren't affiliated previously, but all of their participants were in a downside risk model, that would then mean that the, um, the ACO would be considered experienced. So those are some definitions to give you a sense of what it means for um, um, low revenue versus uh, high revenue. I'll now walk through what this means in terms of the participation options. So uh, this first slide is the low revenue ACOs, um, which is your AB revenue is less than 25% of your AB expenditures for the assigned beneficiaries. So if you're a new legal entity and you're inexperienced, you have all of the tracks available to you, or you're inexperienced, you have all of the tracks available. If you're a new legal entity and um, you're, kind of, you're experienced, which is essentially 40% or more of your participants have previously been on a participant list of a two-sided risk ACO, um, you're ineligible for um, the uh, A through uh, D of the basic track. You could come in at the level E and then enhance is always available to anyone. For re-entering ACOs, which is essentially the, uh, that are inexperienced with downside risks, this is essentially the track one ACOs. Um, they can come in uh, for glide path B through E. And so what that means is instead of having two years under this new model with no downside risk, they would only have one year with no downside risk. Um, for re-entering ACOs that are experienced, meaning that they've had experience in downside at risk, again, tracks A through D are not an option, and they have um, level E and then the enhanced tracks available. For renewing ACOs, it's very similar to re-entering. Um, if it's former track one ACOs can come in at uh, level B, which means in the new model, they would only have one year available of no downside risk before advancing risk. And then experienced uh, ACOs, or renewing ACOs experience with downside risk uh, are not eligible for tracks A through D, but have E and, um, uh, and enhanced available. So that's for the um, low revenue. For high revenue, they have a few less options available. And so that's essentially that they have less opportunity to enter into um, the basic track. Um, so uh, I'll just highlight the differences. So for a high revenue existing ACO that has experience in two-sided risk, they do not have the option to come into the basic track at all. They only have the advanced enhanced track avail available. Whereas um, a new legal entity um, that's considered experienced in downside risk that is low revenue, they're allowed to come into the, uh, the track E, which is similar to the current track one plus. Similarly, on these next two slides, I'll highlight that um, returning ACOs that and renewing ACOs that are experienced with uh, two-sided risk, they do not have Track E available as a participation option. Their only option is to be enhanced. So again, it's just to say that for high-revenue ACOs that have any experience in downside risk, so prior track two, track three, or track one plus, the only option is to come in at the enhanced track. Okay, so a few other just um, technical changes. Um, in terms of financial performance monitoring, CMS discusses that they are gonna monitor if ACOs are um, negative outside corridor. Um, and if a ACO is there for two performance periods, CMS may terminate the ACO. Um, 
there are reductions in um, the MSR and MLR if the ACO falls below 5,000 beneficiaries. There's a slide in, a, in the appendix covering um, what that is, but we don't, in the interest of time, we won't go through it. Um, in terms of the re repayment mechanism, uh, they're requiring 1% uh, total per capita AB expenditures for the assigned beneficiaries or 2% um, of the total AB revenue for ACO participants. And the repayment mechanism must be in place during the duration of the agreement plus an additional 24 months. And then um, they're making some changes to the termination process. You now, the notice to terminate is shortened from 60 days to 30 days, but also um, they're changing the deadline um, to terminate without uh, being responsible for shared losses. I believe it's currently set in October and they're moving it up to June 30th. So if you terminate um, after June 30th, they'll do a full year recon reconciliation and then prorate the shared losses based on the number of months in the program. Uh, in this rule, they also propose some changes to the benchmarking methodology. Um, so the first piece is that they are changing uh, the regional benchmarking approach. You now can have um, regional expenditures included in the, the benchmark beginning with the first agreement period rather than the, the second agreement period. And there is a phase in schedule. It starts at 35% or 25% if your spending is above the region. Um, and then the maximum weight is decreased from 70% to 50%. There's also a cap um, to which the regional adjustment can be factored in, and that is 5% of the national fee-for-service expenditures. They're also proposing some updates in, to the way in which the CMS hierarchical condition categories impact the benchmark. So um, currently, uh, the adjustment can only go down. They are now proposing that the adjustment can go up or down 3% relative to um, the risk score for the um, baseline year three. But that 3% is capped over the course of the entire agreement period. And so now I'll turn it over to Seth to go through the waivers. Great. Thank you, Aisha, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so as a part of this broad movement to, to risk, uh, CMS has uh, made available a number or spread and made available a number of uh, new enhancements uh, and waivers that, that could, they believe, help uh, facilitate and make the, the movement to risk more attractive. Uh, the first of which is the expansion of the skilled nursing facility three-day stay waiver, which has been tested uh, in the Next Generation program as well as for Track 3 ACOs. And essentially what they are doing is they're going to open this uh, waiver up to everyone that's in a two-sided risk model. So that's basic level C, D, and E, uh, as well as the enhanced um, uh, model. And this is going to occur regardless of the assignment methodology. One of their previous reasons for not expanding it across the other models was a concern around utilization for a, um, uh, an ACO that is in a retrospective reconciliation assignment model. But they uh, have decided that they're going to make it available for both prospective and retrospect retrospectively assigned beneficiaries. Um, and essentially the way it would work is that ACOs will uh, receive their initial performance year assignment list, and then they'll get the updated quarterly list as currently happens. Uh, and you'll be able to use the SNF waiver with any beneficiaries who's on uh, those quarterly or prospective uh, assignment uh, files. Um, so that, that is a significant change in, in their policy from previous years. Um, those of you who participated in the Bundle Payment for Care Improvement Initiative uh, likely remember some of the challenges tied to, to implementing the waiver there, and so they've tried to address that. Uh, CMS is not offering the ability for current Track 1 Plus or Track 3 ACOs uh, to apply the waiver um, uh, that would be a, a part of the January 1 start date to the next opportunity to apply for it uh, for existing ACOs would be the July 1, 2019 start date since they're not going to have an application period for, for January 1. 
they're also proposing spreading the applicability of the waiver to providers furnishing SNF services uh, under all swing bed arrangements, uh, particularly uh, to help groups in rural areas that, that have a significant amount of those to be able to, to leverage the uh, opportunity. Uh, in addition to the skilled nursing facility waiver, they're also creating a payment waiver tied to telehealth services. And this is something that was included in the, uh, the Bipartisan Budget Act uh, of 2018. Uh, here, uh, they will um, expand the payments ability to, to physician and practitioners who uh, bill through the 10 of an ACO participant for billing certain uh, services through uh, telehealth uh, to prospectively assign beneficiaries. So this is only available to uh, ACOs that have selected the prospective attribution model. Uh, essentially what it does is it includes uh, the originating site as the beneficiary's home and without regard to geographic limitation. Um, this will be available starting January 1, 2020, uh, again, to all uh, groups that are a part of a two-sided model. So, again, that's basic level C, D, E, the enhanced, the enhanced track, uh, as well as ACOs that will be seeing out their uh, current agreements under track one plus as well as track three. Um, ACOs, uh, again, have to be a part of the prospective uh, beneficiary assignment in order to be uh, eligible for the waiver. And then the list of services uh, that CMS will, will cover under this waiver has been made available, uh, and you can use the link that's uh, at the bottom of the slide. Um, CMS is also interestingly testing certain uh, beneficiary, uh, the ability for ACOs to engage differently with beneficiaries and to develop a, uh, what they're essentially calling a beneficiary incentive program. So uh, this is again available to ACOs that are participating under a two-sided model and they can create this program to provide incentive payments to assigned beneficiaries who receive uh, certain primary care services. So uh, here they'd be eligible to receive a payment if the beneficiary is one assigned to the ACO, uh, either through prospective or retrospective attribution. And the payments can be made for qualifying services, which are primary care services to which coinsurance uh, applies under Part B, uh, and it has to be furnished through an ACO by an ACO professional who has a primary care specialty designation uh, included in the definition of primary care physician, PAs, MPs, or CNSs, or at a federally qualified health center or rural health clinic. Um, the payments amounts are limited to $20 in cash equivalent, so you're not able to, um, as proposed, make a distribution incentive payment through a, a through cash. It has to be uh, through some form of cash equivalent, either a check, a debit card, or a gift card. And there's a stipulation that the payments must be the same amount for beneficiaries without regard to uh, enrollment in other plans, so whether or not they have a Medicare supplemental policy uh, or part of a, a, a Medicaid plan for dual eligibles or uh, in any other insurance policy. Um, CMS is also uh, targeting uh, certain in-kind gifts as being acceptable as long as they have a reasonable connection to the beneficiary's medical care, uh, which is very similar to some of the ability that uh, ACOs currently have in place through, through some of the current waivers. So it will be interesting to see how, how this pro program can help uh, tie um, and grow greater relationships between ACOs and beneficiaries. Uh, and, and also potentially tied to what we're going to talk about momentarily in terms of the voluntary uh, assignment uh, methodology. Um, with that said, as a part of the incentive program, there is a uh, requirement that ACOs maintain records uh, regarding the uh, specific parts of the, the program that they're developing and make these records available to CMS. Uh, the ACO is required to fully fund the costs associated with the program, uh, including the actual incentive payments. Uh, and it's important to note that these payments will be uh, not included in the calculation of the benchmarks, the estimated average per capita expenditures, nor the shared savings or losses. Uh, in addition, the payments are not considered taxable to the beneficiaries who receive them. Uh, so this will be available starting at the mid-year start date, so July 1, 2019, uh, again, for ACOs that are in a two-sided model, 
um, as well as current Track 3 ACOs. Uh, you will have to file a separate application to be able to participate uh, in the model. Um, and ACOs that will be applying on 2019 will need to commit to uh, the initial incentive uh, program term of 18 months with a term reverting to 12 months after the expanded first year, so uh, you know the end of 2019 and 2020. Um, the last piece is that uh, there have been some changes related to beneficiary notification. This is something that CMS has kind of gone back and forth on since the beginning of, of the program. Uh, beginning in July of next year, ACO participants will be required to notify beneficiaries at the point of care uh, that they are participating in an ACO. Uh, the notification will be a standard document that CMS will create uh, that will outline the voluntary alignment process uh, in addition to uh, notifying beneficiaries that the provider suppliers are a part of the ACO uh, and that the uh, beneficiary has the opportunity to decline uh, sharing their claim data. Uh, this would be uh, required to be provided the first primary care visit uh, during each performance year, so not just at the beginning of the agreement period, but, but year over year. Um, the ACOs will also be required to use a template notice um, that CMS would prepare, as I mentioned, uh, and the new notice will be in, in addition to the other beneficiary communication and notification documents, such as the posters that uh, current ACOs are required to place in uh, sites where uh, beneficiaries could potentially receive primary care services. Um, the next is related to the voluntary alignment process. So um, currently there is a, a uh, process within the model that allows beneficiaries to uh, select a uh, practitioner, uh, primary care practitioner to, uh, as, to identify them as their primary care uh, provider. Uh, CMS is proposing that uh, under this current proposed rule that a beneficiary must select a, pr a practitioner with any specialty designation. Uh, to, to be their primary provider. Uh, they also propose to remove the requirement that a beneficiary may, uh, must have received at least one service from that ACO professional uh, within the prior 12 months in order to be assigned to the ACO. So uh, a beneficiary who selects a primary clinician who is an ACO professional uh, will remain eligible assignment to the ACO, really regardless of if they receive the primary care service. Um, CMS is also looking to revise their definition of primary care services to include new HCPCS and CBT codes. Uh, this will take effect on January 1 of 2019. Um, I won't go through each of the codes. You can see they're expanding advanced care planning services uh, codes, administration of health risk assessment services, uh, prolonged e and and psychotherapy services, uh, depression screening, alcohol misuse screening and counseling. Um, as well as uh, looking at some add-on codes for um, complexity inherent to E&M uh, associated with primary care services and, and a number of others. As I mentioned, all of these will uh, be effective starting January 1, uh, 2019, uh, assuming CMS finalizes uh, the calendar year 2019 physician fee schedule as proposed. Um, in addition, they're removing uh, certain uh, aspects of the primary care definition, so looking at the uh, place of service code 31. Uh, they're also looking at excluding certain services billed under CBT codes that are furnished in a skilled nursing facility, uh, which is something that they've heard significant pushback from stakeholders around. Um, essentially, what they'll do is they'll make a determination on whether or not the, uh, the SNF claim was submitted on the same day as the physician service claim, and if the facility co uh, claim is found, the physician claim would not be considered a, a primary care service. Um, so this, again, will, will take effect on January 1 of 2019. Uh, the last piece that I'll cover is uh, an item I alluded to a moment ago, and I, Aisha talked about at the beginning. Uh, CMS is looking at different approaches to beneficiary assignment. Uh, as, as you all know, we're currently under uh, a claim-based methodology where there's a two-step process that CMS utilizes to uh, identify where beneficiaries have received the plurality of their primary care services, 
uh, as well as the voluntarily um, um, assigning a provider as their primary uh, provider. CMS is also now proposing to look at a hybrid opt-in model uh, that will use a modified claims-based assignment methodology where a beneficiary could uh, be prospectively assigned to an ACO if they elect to opt in to the ACO, uh, if they voluntarily align with an ACO professional, uh, or if they have the plurality of their, their um, services from a uh, ACO participant. So this is a little different where um, it allows a, a beneficiary to actually say, I want to be, I want to opt in to the ACO as opposed to designating an ACO professional as their, their primary uh, provider. Um, if, a, if a beneficiary is not prospectively assigned uh, to such an ACO uh, based on either the beneficiary opt-in or bene uh, voluntary alignment, uh, then the ACO can be assigned only if the beneficiary received the plurality of primary care services from an ACO and had at least seven primary care services, include the ones we went over a moment ago, uh, from one or more of the ACO professionals during the applicable assignment window. Um, CMS would also um, allow but not require ACOs to elect an opt-in based assignment methodology during the time of their initial and renewal application. Um, and if you elect to uh, do this hybrid approach, uh, you'll have to stay in place uh, during the duration of the agreement. Interestingly, CMS has a number of uh, questions and concerns that they're asking for comments on related to these uh, around particularly how to handle the benchmark setting, um, how to handle the risk adjustment for folks who opt in but wouldn't have been assigned prior to the, um, prior to the, the agreement starting, and then also how to handle um, ACOs that have low um, volumes of beneficiaries and, and the potential for those groups to fall below 5,000 lives. So uh, more to come on this, and, and I think it will be interesting to see how, how CMS finalizes it. So with that said, Aisha, I'll hand, uh, hand it over to you to, to bring us on home. Yeah, so um, a few final points uh, with regard to the uh, program data and quality measures. CMS does ask for uh, input on what additional information ACOs could use. They have an emphasis on combating the opioid uh, crisis, um, and they specifically ask about what Part D data um, would be beneficial. They are considering um, adding three additional NQF measures to the program, which are listed here, um, and they all address opioids. I will also note that in the physician fee schedule proposed rule, they propose significant changes to the list of measures for the shared saving programs, taking out um, the SNF readmissions and the condition-specific readmissions and then a few of the other measures that are collected through the web interface. Um, so if those changes are finalized in the fee schedule, they would apply um, here as well. Um, they also seek... Uh, uh, as I noted earlier, information on, on what, um, how they can better measure quality in, in the program, how they can address the opioid e epidemic, and how they can incorporate Part D data into the program. Um, on the promoting interoperability side, um, they're proposing to discontinue the use of the EHR quality measure ACO11, which looked at the percentage of uh, participants that met the basic score for the advancing care information um, category under the quality payment program. They are instead proposing just to have ACOs attest that a certain percentage of their uh, participants use certified EHR technology, and so they are proposing 50 percent, but then they note that that's that uh, threshold would change based on the quality payment program um, requirements. So in this uh, recent physician fee schedule proposed rule, they proposed to increase it from 50% to 75% in 2019. So if that's finalized for the QPP, that would be the threshold for um, uh, the shared savings program. They do seek input on if they should have differential thresholds based on the type of ACO, so if the lower risk ones had a lower threshold. Um, 
or if it uh, if there's some other sort of way that the threshold for cert use should change based on which track of the ACO you're in. And then just wrapping up in terms of the extreme and uncontrollable circumstances policy. Uh, you may recall CMS uh, had an interim final policy last year to account for um, recent hurricanes and then finalized it, I think, the end of last year. And so this policy is just that if in the event there is an extreme or uh, uncontrollable circumstance, they will set the ACO's quality at the median. However, if the ACO is able to submit quality measures, they will take the higher score, whether that's, sorry, the mean or um, the ACO's performance. And then in terms of mitigating for shared losses, they'll look at, uh, they'll prorate the shared losses based on the percent of months in which the extreme and uncontrollable circumstance was occurring and then the percent of beneficiaries in the affected area. And so with that, uh, just a reminder of some of the uh, uh, resources we have available. As usual, we will have a, um, a detailed summary that we anticipate having sometime uh, next week. And then I will uh, ask uh, Tina, the operator, if you can provide the instructions for asking questions by the phone. My pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, via the phone lines. You can press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone keypad. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. If you're using a speakerphone, please lift your handset before entering your request. Once again, that is the 1 4 to register a question. One moment, please. And then I'll let Seth uh, talk a little bit about what uh, our Population Health Collaborative is able to help you with. Yeah, thanks, Aisha, and thanks, Tina, while we're waiting. Um, so uh, my role at Premier is I, I lead our Population Health Collaborative, which is comprised of about 75 health systems and clinically integrated networks from across the country who are all engaged in this transition to, to value-based care and population health. And uh, I see many of you are actually on the call today, and I, I, it's just a great opportunity to uh, network with other organizations to leverage our data analytics and benchmarking to help drive performance improvement within your Medicare ACOs and uh, really to to get on the path to be successful under these two-sided models as they're they're coming very rapidly now from CMS. So um, we're here to help uh, you know members of um, uh, the collaborative have, have access to to uh, a number of subject matter experts that can help think through strategy. Uh, particularly how does the market dynamics influence your decision, uh, what is your long-term goals and strategies, um, what is the historical performance of the ACO's influence on the decision, and how does this rule uh, inform your decision as well. So if there's anything we can do to help, please don't uh, hesitate to reach out. I'm here to help. Uh, we have a, a giant team, about 70 folks, who uh, really all we do all day long is, is focus on, on population health and helping organizations be successful. So with that, Tina, do we have any, any questions? We do. Our question comes from the line of Abby Grusa. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Abby. I just wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, for those who are enrolled, so for us, for example, we enrolled last year, so we're in our first year uh, on a track one. Are we able to, do we complete the three-year contract, or are we going to need to switch to the new model, like midstream? All, you're able to finish all of your current agreements, and then okay. once that agreement ends, these would be your options. Okay. That, I knew that would be the one question that we would get is if we were staying where we are for now. So that's perfect. Thank you. We have no further questions via the phone lines, but as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, it is the one four on your telephone keypad. Um, okay, we have some questions in the chat. I think the first one is for you, Seth. Will you be developing a tool to model performance in the various models? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that we're looking at doing as a way to help support our, our collaborative members uh, through the decision process. And, and as you've heard, this is quite a complex rule uh, with a number of nuances dependent upon the uh, composition of the ACO, whether or not you have a hospital included, could, could play a big impact as well as uh, your historic uh, experience within the model. So that is absolutely something we can help with. 
All right. The next question is, will non-advanced APM tracks still be considered as MIPS APMs? And so, yes. So that is tracks A and the basic tracks A, B, C, and D would still meet the criteria for being a MIPS APM under the uh, qual quality payment program. Uh, the next question is, are we now allowed to fall below 5,000 beneficiaries in the first period? So nothing has changed with regard to the um, requirement that an ACO have an, at a minimum 5,000 beneficiaries. What I was touching on is that in the event during an agreement period you fall below 5,000 beneficiaries for a particular performance year, CMS would adjust the um, the MSR, MLR, and so in the appendix of these slides, which will be available later today or tomorrow, there is a uh, chart uh, noting um, how they would adjust that. Um, the next question is, can you clarify if some of the changes uh, of the PFS proposed rule apply to currently participating ACOs, or if these only apply to ACOs joining under the new program? So. The changes um, in the Medicare physician fee schedule, and I mentioned a, a few of them. I know there were ones around quality um, and around the CERT threshold. Those would be applicable to anyone in a current ACO agreement and going forward, but they would also be applicable to any of these new models. Um, the next question is, if patients have less than seven primary care services, are they not assigned to an ACO? And Seth, I think that one was in your area. Yeah, that's right. So you would still, uh, if you were using the traditional claims-based model, still be able to be assigned based on plurality. Uh, based, if you move to the hybrid model as proposed, then I believe that that is where it, it would apply. All right, we just want to pause and see if there's any questions on the phone. We do. We have a question from Sean Franklin. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. I um, submitted my question in the chat and you answered. So I'm um, clear that some of the changes with regard to beneficiary notification or quality measures would uh, potentially apply to ACOs um, currently participating under a current agreement. Um, that's, I think that's what I understood from your answer. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No further questions via the phone lines. Um, okay, and there's a few more um, in the chat. Um, one is, does finishing the current agreement include retaining the 50% shared savings? Does CMS did not make change. There are a few places that we noted throughout where there are changes made to the existing models, but largely they are staying intact if you're in a current agreement. Um, okay, another one is if an ACO participant has submitted a termination notice effective December 31, 2018. Will they automatically remain a participant in the ACO until June 30th, 2019, due to the extended six-month timeline? So um, ACOs have the option. It's not automatic that you would uh, extend through June 30th. Uh, it will be an option to extend. So an ACO has the ability to either end it December 31st of this year or continue for that additional six months through June 30th. Um, are there any notable changes for CPC plus participants who join these ACOs? Beth, do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, well, you know, um, I, I didn't see anything in there that um, altered the uh, relationship between CPC plus and MSSP, um, nor for the relationship between those two models and the quality payment program. Uh, with the exception that, you know, there's now, I guess, a more um, expedient path to becoming an advanced APM, which will uh, align with the CPC Plus's original formation and, and intent. Um, okay. 
All right. There's a question is, um, I understand that current Track 1 MSSPs can continue participation in the current program, but does this apply to only the three-year agreement period or the six-year period? So if you're in a current agreement and it's a, it's your you're in that first three-year agreement, you do not have an option to go um, to stay in the current program. You would have to switch to um, uh, one of these, the basic or enhanced, um, moving forward. So it's, there's no option to renew in the, the existing um, tracks, but uh, you can complete your agreement, whether it's your initial agreement or your renewal agreement. Okay, with that, I know we did not get to all of the um, questions, um, but we've come to our, the end of our time today. We hope this has been helpful and we appreciate you spending time with us. Our contact information is uh, showing on the screen if you have additional questions or feedback about today's event. We will also make sure to um, respond to any of the questions that we missed that came in through the chat. Uh, we'll follow up with you via email in the coming days. And we'll have today's recording posted very soon on the newsroom section of premierinc.com and we'll send an email when it's ready. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.